cool thing tomorrow. So we're just about ready. Right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, we have a culinary demo with Hi, three and original AJ. recipes from an absolutely extraordinary chef who has been on my radar ever since I first heard about him from Dr. Furman. He owns two restaurants in Colorado, and he is a nutritarian chef, and I can't wait to hear how he became that. He really is an extraordinary chef, and he understands how to marry beautiful, delicious cuisine with health. His name is Chef Martin Oswald, and I'm so excited to have you on the show today. All right. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice to be on your show. I know you for so many years, too, AJ, and I'm really so happy to do this finally. Yeah, I, I like it. See, see, cause I'm a, I'm a chef, but I'm not a chefy chef. You're the real deal. So I'd love to hear your story first, how you became a chef, but then a nutritarian chef. Most people would not expect that or even know what that is. Uh, <laughs> it's a long, long story. Right. But I started when I was uh, 15, I was started cooking in a, a health resort near where I grew up in Austria. Uh, it was the Wilfinger spas. Right. And back then everybody cooked microbiotic and, it's just a totally different style, but nevertheless, even in the 80s, we got some good stuff going on. Eventually, I moved, uh, because I was sort of a little bit curious, I moved on to Willy Dungel. Now, Willy Dungel in Austria was a very famous health resort. So we had everybody there. We had all the Formula One racers. We had all the ministers, everybody from Europe. Eventually, Boris Becker came there for retreats and so on. So it was... Uh, sports, health, medicine, if you will. Anyhow, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rush. See that? You have seen it. Yep. So you know who I'm talking about. The, the guy who gets his burn in the car, his name is Nicky Lauda. Okay. And so Willy Dunger was Nicky Lauda's personal chef and, and a, a personal assistant. Okay. So... It was really interesting. He traveled the whole world with him. They're car racing on the streets in Austria and just crazy stories right there. But anyhow, one day, Nicky Lauda comes into the restaurant. It was like a whole resort for 150, uh, with 150 bedrooms, right? So anyhow, so he comes in and I'd worked there for a couple of months. And anyhow, so Willie Dungu comes back and, and he just starts screaming at us. You know, he's like, Nicky needs more iron. Nicky needs more iron. And and everybody's looking, right? We're looking at each other. We're like, we, I am sure what do you need, right? And so he goes over the kitchen, right? Or the chef standing there. He grabs a handful of parsley and throws it in the soup and runs back out again to Nikki's table, right? <laughs> so anyhow, so it was such an eye opener because you would never think of iron as a food. I was, well, then I was 18 years old, right? And, uh, and so it opened my eyes a little bit, right? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. There's a different way to think about food. Okay, so that was a big step for me. But I wasn't really like sword, right? So then much later, I lived in San Francisco, uh, where I watched Dr. Dean Ornish, by the way, uh, uh, in 1992. Uh, very interesting. But anyhow, so I had a girlfriend at a time and her dad, uh, had a heart, a heart attack, a massive heart attack, right? So, so everybody was worried and, you know, people don't understand how, how much it impacts our family, right? So, but anyhow, so we went through this process and then a friend of his had done a bypass surgery and he had brain damage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever come across on this, but in the nineties, when you do bypass surgery, many times, you know, these machines don't work properly. You know, next thing you know, you have a little memory loss. Bill Clinton had that for a little bit, for example, right? But anyhow, so, so since a friend of his had it, he didn't want to cut his chest open and do the operation. So he got on the Dean Ornish diet. And now it's 30 years later, and he never had a heart attack again. Right. So, but you see this gradually. So it's not like an instant thing. It's not the first week, the first month, first year, because you always expect, oh, he's going to have another heart attack. Right. But eventually eating the way he did, living the lifestyle he did. And after five, 10 years, you're like, oh yeah, you know, this actually works. 
And uh, so it was very, very powerful to witness this. And, and after that, I'm sort of like, you know, this, this is the real deal, you know? So, so anyhow, so um, many, many years later, and I try to be shorter, but <laughs> it's a lot, stories are so long. Uh, some 10 years ago, I think I may have had pre-diabetes. I felt a result drowsy. I was at 225 pounds. You know how it is. You're in the kitchen, you're working all day long, you're eating brownies all day long, you know, just sugar coffee, just to keep you going, keep you going. I do really big catering events, you know, so it's really high stress environment. And uh, eventually I just had to say, okay, I'm done. And so I wanted to go back to my original calling, which was the health food. And through that process, I went to Whole Foods back then and, and I discovered the Eat to Live cookbook from Dr. Joel Foreman. And not long after that, they opened a restaurant. It all happened within a few short months. I lost 30 pounds, just going on this nutritarian diet uh, in, in two months, worked really effectively. I never felt tired. It was a really great experience for me. And uh, a, fr- a common friend of ours said, oh, Oh, I know Dr. Foreman, a guest of mine, Shelly Summer. And she was like, well, I don't I know Dr. Foreman. We, we're going to invite him here, right? So he, he flew to Aspen and we all hooked up and then we did the Nutritarian Festival. And, you know, now I'm in his uh, book, Eat to Live, the cookbook. And he has invited me to speak in various lectures, you know. So that's that's part of the story. Anyways. That's amazing. That yeah. is, that yeah. is, I'm just, I, you're kind of unique. I mean, how many chefs can say they're a nutritarian chef? <laughs> well, you know, there is actually quite a few. Uh, James Robach is one of them. You know, there's, there's really like a lot of uh, chefs who sort of quietly follow it. Uh, you'll be surprised some of the more famous chefs even. Uh, they go on diets and they, they know about fasting. And, and by the way, this, we had a fasting program in Austria that lasted 10 years, uh, 10 days, I'm sorry. Uh, 10 years is a long time not to eat. <laughs> about that. So 10 days, and then they will break it with a baked potato. And it was just stunning for me as a chef back then. I was 18 years old, and I saw it, and I was like, well, you're cutting into my business. You know, you're not, you should be eating food so I can cook something for you. <laughs> but it was such a fascinating experience that, that most unhealthy people went on a 10 day fast. They had teas and so on. And so even back then, you know, there was a, that was a, 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 a very important approach for that uh, really don't be concept. That's fantastic. Did, where did you go to culinary school? So I went in Austria, a place called Gleichenberg and that's all the, all the, the chefs in Austria do apprenticeship, which is really fantastic. You know, you start at 15 and you have three years. You go every year, two months, you go to school, you learn a little bit French, you know, all the classic dishes. And for 10 months, you work. So you don't get paid much. I mean, I got back then per month, $120. <laughs> but school is paid for. Okay. So when you turn 18, you graduate. And now you're a full chef. And at 21, you become a master chef. If you want to take that route, you can open your own business, you know? So it's a good program. That's fantastic. Wow. At your restaurants, can people get SOS free meals? So they can, absolutely. Uh, we have even done food programs to where we have, I work with Dr. Laurie Marbis, which I think you had on your show a couple of times. Many times. times. I love her, yes. Telehealth. An old hair group, so Dr. Chris Miller was on there, and we had a whole host of doctors here in the Valley. And we were actually cooking and doing uh, whole programs for people. Uh, it's about 200 people that we provided SOS free foods, and they're very effective, and the numbers are so great. And I think the one thing for those viewers that see this the very first time or they just got into this, uh, it, it works really fast, especially like the first week, the first 10 days, the numbers are really, really dropping off really fast on cholesterol on, on all the blood measures, right? So I did a test with uh, uh, Dr. Laurie Marbis, a, a trial, I guess it's called. And so we had in her hospital at the time, we had 26 of her patients and 
we had up to 27.7% cholesterol loss in 30 days. And I thought it was very powerful because I had cooked for like six, seven years in the restaurant already. And it's one thing to talk about how healthy this stuff is, but it's another one to actually do it with blood work. And so we did this and I was just cooking lunch and dinner and I talked to Laurie Marbis for her together. I mean, she persuades everybody. She's like so good to really get a cohesive program to people and really like put that out there so they understand it. And that's the most important part. You know, for me to just cook, that's easy, right? Like, you know, um, so, so, but it was very successful. We had one person drop out of the study. Many times of these studies, lots of people drop out, right? So, um, and all the measures went down and we had one young girl who had like acne in her face really bad. She was like 20 or so. And her acne is, you know, she's eating hot dogs and burgers and all that stuff, right? And then she's eating, you know, nutritarian style or, you know, vegan plant-based food. And within seven, eight days, her skin cleared off. And she was more happy than the guy who lost 80 points cholesterol <laughs> because it's such a big impact, you know, it's such a visual thing, you know. So she was just overwhelmed and enjoyed, you know. So that this kind of food works for a lot of people for a lot of different scenarios. That's fantastic. Yeah. So what what recipes have you created for us today? All right, so today I want to focus on big flavor. I think it's, I don't know, I sent something. Yeah, well, there it is. Yep. So yep. lemon, lemon uh, risotto, lemon cauliflower risotto, you said. Yes. A, an aromatic Thai soup. And I don't know what Vaduvian is, but you're going to make Vaduvian sweet potatoes with green lentils. You, you're going to hold me to it too, right? There's no... <laughs> like I do two dishes and they walk off. <laughs> okay, but you, but you gave the recipe for all three. So if you only have time for two. <laughs> so that's good. So why we don't just start right off and jump right into it. And so again, I just want to be clear. There's other classes that teach you about cutting and all this kind of stuff. That's not what this class is about. This is about big flavors. So today we're going to talk about how can you create more flavors? Because I get this question all the time, right? So how can you really impart more flavors? It's about spices and aromatics that's what the whole class is about and so that's why i have three dishes and i'm going to start off with the first dish and i hope you can see this art i'm going to go back there um if anybody cannot hear me this would be the time to let me know but i have prepared and i don't know is it posted at the thai soup chef aj yeah i mean sure is it posted yet so people can yeah, see it? Yeah. Oh, yes. All the recipes that you gave me, are. I couldn't post the spice blends because there's only 5,000 words in the show notes, but I posted all of the recipes. All right. Good. Okay. So then when we look at this recipe, I'm going to fly over this because it makes no sense to really overly explain it, but I'm going to explain the crucial items to you. Okay. So in this case, we have... In the first soup here, it's, it's just a soup. Basically, it's a cabbage soup, but you don't want to sell this to your husband or, or, or boyfriend because nobody wants cabbage soup, right? So, so we make it a fancy Thai soup. Okay, so I have these aromatics here. This is the lemongrass. And they're really, really nice. Now, you can, you can punch them with a mallet or something and you relax, uh, release the juices. Or in this case, I have another trick that I'm going to explain later on. I'm just gonna put it right into the soup, okay? The next thing I have is galangala. It looks a little bit like ginger root. Okay, so check this out. This is the best thing ever. This is so fragrant. Galangala is my favorite flavoring for anything. And what's so nice about this is you can make any curry and you just put a little piece in there. And then later on, when you when you actually have the curry or the soup or whatever, all you're doing is you can like put it in your mouth and bite on it and release the juices. And that's the best part, okay? But it will season your soup really well, okay? So I put those things in my pot here. Then I have here, this is a local organic grower, lime leaf, right here 20 miles from me. And he grows the most best ever Kaffir lime leaf. Can you see this? Look at this. Look how beautiful this thing is. This smells like citrus. 
So we have different flavors of citrus. We have a lime, we have a little bit more lemon from the lemongrass, and the galangala is also like a citrus-like flavor. And then what I really like to do as a salt replacement or is to ginger. So I put my ginger in there, everything is hot. And when you read the recipe, it really just say drop everything in there. Okay, now here I have cabbage. I put everything at once. You can go fancy and you saute it a little bit, but for this particular soup, I don't really, I don't really think we need it. I got carrots in here. Carrot is another big flavor. And then shiitake, of course, is a lot of umami. So again, you know, we're building our aromatics. We're building flavor, we're building flavors, okay? I'm gonna put that in here. And I have, everybody knows normally you have really spicy soups there and spicy and sweet. So, so when you eat in a Thai restaurant, it's just sugar all the time, right? Um, the more spice you make, the more acidity put in, the more sugar you're gonna need, right? So you can either choose to use less acidity and then you'll need as much sugar. But the same goes for spice. The sugar overcomes the spice a little bit, right? So I always recommend, I go halfway in between. I put a lot of, of I like mine spicy. So what I do is I put a little dates in there. I have chopped my dates already and I put them right in with the soup, okay? Then next I have, well, I don't know if people can see this here. So this is, I've combined three cups of veggie stock. This is the engine from Dr. Esselstein. You can use this, you can make your own. I have nice recipes for your own stock without salt, of course. But anyhow, so for this soup, we're just gonna put in the stock and the potatoes. Okay. Then here I have a coconut milk. This is a low fat. This is a this is a organic low fat. This is 20%. And the reason why I do it is because I couldn't remember to get the water. So I had to borrow this from my neighbor. But what you can do at home, what you can do at home is you take coconut water. So when I cook for Dr. Furman's event, we just use coconut water. You don't need any fat in soup whatsoever, okay? So, but a coconut flavor of some sort is good. So we're gonna put that in here. And all I'm doing is I bring this to a boil, okay? And voila, this is the first soup. So the point of doing this is really more or less Okay, I'm gonna get the potatoes here on the bottom. I need a little bit more stock. The cabbage will cook down, by the way, okay? I'm just gonna make sure my, my potatoes are right on the bottom. And I gotta actually put in one more cup of the stock. So I'm gonna wait for this to just get down a little bit. We're gonna measure. I made also some house-made uh, veggie stock. What I do in my stock is I always put in shiitake mushroom. Dried is the best, or porcini mushroom. That's sort of my secret recipe as far as like getting more umami in there. And then also lavage. Okay, so that's the soup. We're just boiling it up and let that simmer for however long the potatoes take. So potatoes is what you want to watch out for with this soup, okay? Is that good? That's yeah. it. Yeah, I love that. The, I love that the potato is how they broke their fast at the Austrian fasting center. At True North, I think it's zucchini, but man, potato. I mean, it must have tasted pretty good after ten days off of food. I, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, you can only imagine interior in a hotel setting with everybody eating right next to you, and they loved it. We had four different programs. Uh, we had one that you would make surf at uh, True North. But theirs was like really plain. There was no seasoning allowed of any kind. There was only like a herb mixture they used. And so they would cook like either polenta or grains in those days, microbiotic, right? And uh, that was really the whole, whole idea for those people who really had already heart attacks and so on. So anyhow, so we move on to our next dish here. You can go to the next recipe. We're just gonna let this cook in here. Wait, Chef Elizabeth says, isn't coconut water naturally sweet? 
Yes, it will be naturally sweet. So depending what you use, don't put the dates in just yet, right? Again, think of it this way. The sugar always comes with the spice and with the sourness. So the more you have there, the more you need a little lime in there or so on. I actually, at the end, if you ever get to it, I have this set up. This, up this goes into our dish to finish it off, which is lime, a little bit more uh, chili. All right, there we go. All right, so our next dish, and I, I can explain the soup more. So let's just cook for us and then I explain it more in the tail end. So if you have any questions for me, hit me up, but let's do it at the tail end, okay? So here I have sweet potatoes. These are medium sized, okay? Keep in mind, whatever the recipe says is depending on how large the potato is, okay? It may take 45 minutes or it can take 90 minutes, but if you have those big monster ones, okay? But what's important is here, you want to get the air out. You want to release the air. Otherwise, it just steams and it pops. Uh, I put it right into my container here. Uh, if you want to be nice to your loved one, which in this case, she does the cleaning for me, believe it or not, which is so nice. You put actually something underneath it because the potato is going to ooze out, right? It, it, it ooze out that molasses and it's going to stick on my container here. I just have a glass so you can see this. So you can do it two ways. You can put a parchment paper in there so it doesn't stick so bad, or you just put a little splash of water in there. Works perfectly fine. Okay, so we're going to put this in the oven. Bam. And we're going to bake this now for like 45 minutes. My oven, you cannot see on this camera, but it's just 450 degree, and I put it in the oven, okay? Next, we're going to cook. Okay, so I can smell already the galangala coming out of the soup. It's, it's coming to a boil and right away you can smell it. It's so fantastic. This is like the best aroma I can ever think of. Um, next, we're gonna cook. And can you folks see this here? Sort of, I hope. Um, we're gonna cook a lentil, a lentil stew. And so I show you a little different variety. So I thought about this more as an Indian dish. I do so much French because I love French. Um, come to think of it, Chef H, what's your favorite profile? Your oh. favorite flavor profile? Oh gosh, um, probably Thai. Probably Thai. Yeah. So I'm right on. So you should be. You would smell this, right? Can you smell it? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I can. <laughs> but I like I like Mexican. I mean, I like Mexican too. I, you know, so it's hard to decide. Oh, especially you grew up in California, is that right? Right. So you know, everything was Tex-Mex, and so I do. Ah. I, I did get used to those flavors, and I do love Chipotle and things like that. Yes, me too. I love it. So much flavor. So much big flavor. Okay, so one. As the soup comes to a boil, I just put it down to a simmer. So this is going to take like 20 minutes. You just check the potatoes. That's all you worry about, okay? So we leave the soup aside, and now we're going to focus on our green lentils, okay? The recipe says, for the green lentils, onion, carrot, celery, basically all the veggies, you put in the pot, okay? I don't do as much water sauté as I should, but nevertheless, um, I'm a fan, normally I would, you could start with just onions. What I'm seeking out is the most moist vegetables. So the moist ones are the onion and the celery. But to make the recipe a little bit easier, I put everything in at the same time. And so I have this philosophy when you're, you're, when you're putting in, which again, these are called aromatics, by the way, okay? This is classic French. It, it, every region has their own aromatic, right? But for French cooking, French Indian in this case, uh, this is a classic celery, onion, carrot, and garlic. And all I'm doing is I'm trying to suck out the water and I'm more or less toasting the onions to get more flavor out of it. All I really want to try to do is make it more sweet and more fragrant and more powerful and more flavorful. We're looking for the flavor. So to me, the better you can do there, again, the moist veggies, peppers, onions, 
and the salary will work really well because they can't drain so much water. Okay. Now, a lot of people go to the uh, water sustain. So you put a little splash of water in there and so on. And that would work really great too. For me, I do more like I just watch it and I could just stir it, stir it, stir it. And when I feel I get that aroma, when I smell it really fragrant, that's when I move on to the next step. Does that make sense? Yep. So, so this takes like three to five minutes first. But since we're cooking so many dishes, we're gonna shorten this process. Can you everybody see this? I don't know if you can take it here. So this is what this looks like. Okay, I'm gonna adjust my little uh, soup down to broth again, the little simmer. My wife is gonna love me doing all those dishes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I think everybody gets the idea here, yes? So we looked down the recipe. I would say if you give this like five minutes, that would be a good idea, right? So the more you give it, the better, but then you need to stir this all the time, right? If you're in a rush and you don't feel like stirring so much, well, use the water by any means, right? So you put all the veggies in there. I have also leeks here. I love leeks, I chop them really small. I think they impart a different layer of flavor than onions. Onions and leeks are the same allium family, and Dr. Foreman always advises to eat lots in the allium family. So I'm a strong believer in onions, okay? Really think, having read, I mean, quercetin is one of those phytonutrients in there, for example, that comes to mind. But it's like so much more going on, hundreds of phytonutrients in onions, except something you want to have in our diet. Okay, so now I can see that it's starting to sweat. That's what you're looking for. Again, I put no water in there yet. So, I, you know, I'm an impatient man, especially when I do these live shows. <laughs> if you have any questions, this is a good time to ask me. Well, I'm just curious, what's the, what are some of the more, most popular dishes at your restaurants? Those are the sweet potato and meat. And a fallow risotto that comes off the menu now, but it's, it's going to come back on in the winter time. So I do the winter, summertime. Uh, we do the spring roll, and I do a nutritarian spring roll. So that means, you know, when you ever have the, or summer roll, they call it, right? And normally you have only uh, rice noodles in there. And there's like no nutrition in there, right? So mine are just loaded with veggies and lots of mint, lots of basil. And then on the side, we do a little peanut that I thin out with curry. I have a really nice uh, Vardavan spice that I use in there. And so, so people really like the combination. You know, it's so light, it's perfect for people to eat. Then I have to have watermelon gazpacho, which is, you know, watermelon in Spanish cooking would be, well, it would be all bread. Like a spacho in itself is 50% bread almost sometimes, right? A friend of mine here owns a Spanish restaurant. So they, they use a lot of white bread in there. So you think you eat something really healthy, right? Oh, it's a gazpacho. Well, is it maybe bread or not, right? So in our, our nutritarian style of gazpacho, it's, again, it's a lot of onions. I put a lot of red peppers in there. The super high on vitamin C, of course, and so many other nutrients. And then I put a lot of, so there's very little watermelon. Watermelon makes it sweet, okay? So I don't use any sugar. And for those of you who don't know, water, watermelon have a very high glycemic index, but a very low glycemic load. So it's actually a really good fruit, right? Or healthy fruit. The glycemic load of watermelon, because of the fiber is, it takes time to absorb and you don't get the sugar rush you would from other fruits. Or, or just sugar products, I should say. All right, so we're right there. I can really smell this now, okay? So this is really taking over my kitchen, the flavor there. And again, it's about establishing a first layer of flavor. And that's really the aromatics, right? So I'm really strong believer in that. I put my garlic in there. I could have added that a little earlier, that's okay. And I have a little ginger in that too to round it up. All right, 
And let's see. I'm inviting some friends over for later on. So this actually has to taste really good. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I want to saute the garlic a little bit more. And my aromatics look really good. So again, there's no water in here so far. And if you look at it, it's, it's really nice. It's steaming, it's concentrating the flavor. All right, so from here, this is the crucial part from this entire dish. And I'm sure Chef Aja, you, you do this all the time because you get yelled at when we burn the spices in our cooking, right? <laughs> when I was apprenticeship in Austria, it was always like, we make goulash, you know, which is a paprika and caraway and, you know, and you cook the onions for like two hours, you cook them brown. And then you put the spices in and if you burnt the spices, you were, you were burned in hell, right? I mean, this was it, you know, they would come after you, right? So, so when you put the spices in, you want to toast them. You want to release the flavor. You want to get out all the fragrant oils, okay? So here I have a little garam masala. I don't do it to overpower the dish. I'm just doing it as a base flavor. Garam masala, we get, get into the spices later on has a nice combination. So there's clove, there's cinnamon, there is cardamom in there. It's really nice. It's an earthy flavor. It's a nice background flavor, if you will. Okay. So let's put that in there now. But again, once I put it in, you have to take note. I only have like 30 seconds and then I will put my liquid in there. Okay. Actually, I'm going to pour my liquid for us. I've made a little stock with all my trimmings here. When you stock, I always like my cabbage in there. That's a big Austrian thing. We put cabbage in there. Then we put lovage in there. We're going to tell uh, later, we're going to talk about the lovage of first. And I put a dried porcini or shiitake mushroom. And they really release the flavor, right? So for any veggie stock you make, I use caraway seeds a little bit. I use coriander seeds to overcome the salt deficiency a little bit. But lavage to me is, is really where it's at. Okay, so this really smells great right now. I'm at the perfect stage for my veggies. Now I'm gonna put in my spices, the chilies and the garam masala. And so we sort of count for 30 seconds. I don't know who has a timer, but somebody's gonna time me right now, right? <laughs> what you're really looking for is just the flavor. I'm going to take this off the flame right now a little bit. And once you really smell it, I really smell it. Now it's coming out, right? This is really releasing all its flavor. And right then at that moment, you need to deglaze it. In the olden days, so if you like, you can put wine in there, a little white wine, a little red wine or something. But the entire idea of this dish is to capture the spice, the toasted spice flavor. All right, so I'm gonna bring this to a quick boil. I actually need four cups, I'm gonna need a little bit more. All right, making a mess out of my kitchen at first. All right. So, First, there's an induction burner. I don't know if you have induction, but this is a big thing now for people who are conscious on the environment, you know, so I do actually cooking classes on the induction burners. And it's been a lot of joy because I get to mix in my nutritarian cooking style with teaching how to cook uh, on an induction burner, which I think is far superior. The induction burners, of course, they cook really fast. Everything comes to boil soon super fast and then you can really if I just a number you get the perfect simmer or is not main man is at stage six and they always simmer it at six and it's real nice to get that consistency okay so I'm going to check on my soup here so obviously this these potatoes and everything is going to take a little while but the smell here is really fantastic 
this is really what you, what you get out of this soup right now is actually more like the kaffir lime leaf. The roots, the big root that we put in there, the galangula takes much longer to get that, release that fragrancy. So you don't want to cook that for like 20 minutes and really like impart the flavor of the galangula. If you don't have galangula, don't worry about it. You know, you'll, you'll just use more ginger, okay? All right. Our soup is almost done. Meanwhile, we're gonna go back to the lentil dish. Here again, I use uh, thyme. I just use these thyme sprigs and I put them right in there. And what's so nice about this is actually where you can just simply, you don't have to clean them off. You just take out the stem after they're cooked. So just put the horse stem in there. And then our local farmer grows also nice bay leaves. So I get them right here on the stem. I just love the bay leaf, it's really, it's really unique background flavor. So again, for the aromatics, a bay leaf is really important. If you have a dry one, don't use too many. The fresh one takes a little bit more. So here we go. This has already come to a boil. I'm gonna put my bay leaf in there. Three bay leaf in this case, because they're fresh. Then I put my tomato right in there. I got a little bit of that uh, tomato there, or just rinse it out. I never like the waste on all these dishes, so I just rinse it out with a little bit because it will uh, stuck. And last but not least, our lentils. So I have two cinnamon sticks, and I could have toasted them too. So, so that's a good, nice little thing to do. But in this case, I'm just going to drop them right in there, and I'm going to drop my lentils. If you don't know how to clean lentils, by the way, I'm going to show you real quick. Don't cook any kind of lentil you have may have stones. I have done this already, so I'm not going to do it twice. But what you do is you have the lentils on one side on a white plate. That helps a lot. Okay. Like, let me put a little bit more on so you can see this. And it goes really fast. Okay. So all you need to do is these are green lentils, French lentils. And you want to just look at the, the lentils here and look for stones. And all you're doing is you're just moving them over really super fast, go super fast. You can do 10 pounds in just a couple of minutes. But if you don't do it occasionally, there's a little rock in there. And unless it's your third teeth, it's a bad idea. <laughs> so, so pick up your stones on the lentils. And then as soon as your stock comes to a boil, we're gonna add the lentils into it. So I have one cup of lentils here. And I'm gonna do the same thing as before. I'm just gonna simply uh, let that simmer. I wanna bring it to a boil one time fast. Uh, let's see, crank this up a little bit. So I got some, I got some competing flavors going on here, right? So one is, <laughs> Calangula, and the other one is more like an Indian flavor. So it's quite interesting smell in my kitchen because all these dishes compete for attention, I guess, right? So I'm just gonna bring this to a boil here real quick with the lentils. And then all you have to do is bring this back and simmer it for 15 minutes on my number six. All right, so. Let me see if I can get this started because I don't want to get too confused. So at this stage, I think we just want to like, maybe try to finish these two dishes up. And then we can see if we get to the risotto. Okay, the potatoes are almost done. The, the tenderness of the potato, you want to have a little bite, okay? So I'm going to just turn this off right now. This is already done. I, I honestly don't know how many minutes it has been, but always check. It depends how large you cut the potatoes, right? Maybe 50 minutes, maybe 25 minutes, you know, it depends. Um, so I turn the soup off. We're just going to let that infuse a little bit, which is very nice. And then meanwhile, we're going to finish off the sweet potato dish. Here. I have one more thing that I wanted to add in my lentils. 
the landscape apricots, and these are Turkish apricots. So these are organic Turkish, they're dark brown. There's no food coloring in there. There's no sugar in there. This is a really, really great product. Uh, I get this for you on FI. So I'm not sure it would be a special order for you at home. And again, I go with a little sweetness. Why? Because there's a the tartness in there. You know, the lentils, they have their own little thing. You don't need to use it at all, right? For me, for my palate, I'm a little sweet tooth. I do it that way. Okay, so we're gonna go over here. I'm gonna show you next how to do the sweet potato, okay? Now it hasn't been 50 minutes yet. Actually, I didn't even put the timer on. <clears throat> so it must be like 30 minutes or so. I don't know if you can see this on the camera. You can see they're starting to ooze a little bit. So they're definitely 50 minutes. They're really hard, right? If I put my if I put my fork in there right now, you couldn't, you cannot even get through with the fork, right? So it does take 50 minutes. But, but let's pretend the 50 minutes are up. What I'm gonna do next is I take the potatoes out, I peel the potato, and I cut it in half. Okay, everybody got that? I just peel the potato and I cut it in half. And what I get then is sweet potatoes. Peeled and cut in half. It's a miracle, right? Everybody should have a sous chef at home, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> if only. So, so they're fully roasted. All we need to do is we just reheat them. So I have a little technique for you at home. I have almonds and uh, at the Nutri-Curian food style, we do use almonds and nuts because there's so many minerals and there's so many health benefits on other sites on the healthier fats. You know, everybody's got to, to decide on their own what everybody wants to go for. But anyhow, so I use these almonds right here. They're just standard sliced almonds, okay? And there's a, a nice easy trick here. I have a Vodavan spice. A Vodavan is an English curry, uh, French curry. A French curry, can you see this? This is mustard. There's lots of roasted shallots in there, lots of garlic, lots of fenugreek. Fenugreek is so awesome, it's so good. This is, this is flavor-wise, it's as good as it gets, really. Um, so, so what you're gonna do here is, I put it right here in my bag. Aha. And then I close this bag again. And then I use my mallet and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this a little bit. Can you actually see that? I cannot see it on my camera. This is high tech. No, I spent yeah, years. So, so, so you're using a meat tenderizer to chop your nuts. It's still good for something. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love the ingenuity. But you could also use, so use a little pen, and you go like this. It works just as good, okay? And what I like to crush is also a little bit the mustard seeds. In this case, I have four mustard seeds in this bag. Looking, looking for a nice. Want to have some chunks here. Okay, I don't want it like completely crushed, which is like a nice chunky stuff here, okay? So now, so again, we have the sweet potatoes, they're roasted, they're fully cooked, they're cut in half, they're peeled, right? And all I do is I put my spice mixture on here. This is actually a dish similar to what I made for Wolfgang Puck. A Wolfgang Puck, when I worked in San Francisco, they had a restaurant there at Post Trio. I don't know if you remember that. That's like 92, right? Um, we had a salmon dish and we put like a half an inch of almonds on there and then we put a little butter over it and that would stick it together and then it just roast the whole thing, right? <laughs> so in this case, I use. See, I thought a sweet potato, almond, oh yeah, that's like perfect, right? So I, I use this 
and I put a good amount of on there. I'm gonna show you in a second. I would see like a, a teaspoon, but it depends honestly on how spicy your vadovan is. So some are more spicy, some are less spicy. Uh, you can season them on both sides if you like. But again, all this goodness, the shallots, the garlic, the everything is on the hair now, right? Uh, just laid it up a little bit. So I hope everybody can see this at home. And that's all there is. And now I'm just going to toast. Think of it as toasting the spices because you really talk about big flavor. Well, that's what we're doing next. Okay, so we're going to put it back in the oven. You cannot see it here, but I have an oven back here. That's at 425 degrees. I'm really bad with my timing, so I'm going to put the timer on. My wife cooks with timer and she does it always much better than me because I burn everything. <laughs> I cook at home. Uh, it's such a different style of cooking. All right. So let's swing back a little bit to our soup. Right? You can see in the foreground, we have the lentil cooking. And I put that in a little pot that's from yesterday because I, I cooked the batch yesterday. And then we almost ended up eating everything, right? So <laughs> my kids are so hungry. My, my son is 17, right? And so, you know, we're like, oh, no, no, we got to save some for tomorrow for Chef H. A., you know? So, <laughs> so luckily we saved one water here. It's already fully cooked. These are the lentils here. I don't know if you can see the pot. Um, the large pot is still cooking. So um, this is fully cooked, but I'm gonna swing back briefly to the first soup with that, the Thai soup. Okay, so not to be too confusing, right? So we're gonna go to the Thai soup and we're gonna test it. You know. And I think for any chef, the most important part is know how to taste, right? So if you're going for big board flavors, you gotta know how to taste, you gotta know how to put it together, how to fix something. That's the fun part of cooking, right? So here we go. Let's see here. Am I talking too much? What is What time frame do we have here? Do we have enough time to, yeah? Have plenty of time, as I mentioned. I can, I can cut it back if you need me to. Nope, nope, I'm enjoying this. I love watching a real chef cook. And I'd love to ask you some questions about chefs in general, why some seem so resistant to not using oil. Like when you go to a restaurant and say no oil, they look at you like you're from Mars. <laughs> so that's, that's actually fairly easy because I too thought about it many times, but a, everybody's trained and there is no stigma towards oil, right, for the general public. And food addiction and calorie addiction is so huge, right? So what chefs do is just what the customers want. If you want to change that, then we need to get more customers to demand oil free. That's the way to change it. But a business or a restaurant owner will tell their chef, oh, you're going to put the aioli on, you're going to put the cheese on, you're going to deep fry this because that's what... When I have a number one seller, I had a restaurant for many years here locally. Um, we serve burgers and fries and so on. I try to switch it over more vegetarian and so on, but there's a certain crowd that is not responding to that. So it's up to us as educators and so on to get people there, but it cannot put that, what is it? Horse before the cart or whichever, the cart before the horse. You know? So you can't really do that, right? So after you learn about it, Yes, then you may have a clientele base. And maybe at the end, remind me on that question because I have maybe something for you I want to share with you at the end of this session. Okay? So, I don't know, did I answer your question enough that uh, chefs, I think, that should, it's right. really a business related. It's because people, for the most part, the people that eat that way generally aren't the ones that are supporting the restaurants. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to taste this now. And what we want to taste when we taste is the, obviously the sweet soya, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, you know, umami, of course, is a big thing. And then also I like to add piquant into it, piquant or spicy. I think spicy is its own profile. I can taste spicy from a mile away. So it's sort of like all this chili, Mexican food, and all the ethnic cooking you have. Spice creates something separately, I think, right? So I, I consider six flavors versus five that most others would think of. Anyhow, so I'm gonna taste my soup now. And what I wanna do is, 
So I've done like some, I've, I've created like a, I've helped people out, create a chain restaurant and, and you deal just with spices, right? And what you want to do is you want to only focus on one flavor at a time and you really get down to it. If you go like to the top level, how you taste something, I worked with a master sommelier for 10 years, you know, so they have their own methods of how to do this, right? So they distinguish, they eliminate certain flavor profiles. This is how they know, oh, that wine is coming from France. This one is coming from Australia, right? In cooking, you can use the same technique. I only flow, focus on just one thing at a time. When I do my serious cooking, I make notes. Out of 10 points, is the five. Five is perfect. 10 is too much. One is not enough. And so I'm going to go for saltiness right now. Do I have any saltiness in there? There shouldn't be any saltiness in there, right? Yeah, sure enough, there's no saltiness in there, right? But it's not bland either. Right? If, if this was like a classic restaurant or something, this would be at like a two or a three, something like that. A two maybe. Why? Because the galangala and the ginger help this stuff out so much. And this is. Okay, so I'm actually happy with, I haven't overcome the start issue. Can you see it, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I'm okay with this because that's what we're doing. We're trying to cook. We're trying to cook without salt, right? It's not going to taste the first salt profile, but we don't want that. But the galangal is really, really great thing. So the next thing is, is it sour, right? Is it sweet? And so I'm going to just speed this process up, but you want to do one by one and sort of educate your palate of distinguishing one or the other. But is there anything bitter in there? Well, I know the cabbage has enough the bitterness, right? I know already I put a little sweetness in from the dates. Now, is it enough or not? That's the question, right? So I'm happy. I don't really taste on the soup yet, but I know when I eat this soup, I will bite into a date eventually, and then I get that rush of sweetness, okay? So it's a little weird. It's not the classic Thai soup because that's just sugar, but here you're going to taste the sugar as you bite into it. So I'm happy with that, but I don't have enough acidity in there. But I have this covered at the end. I have a little line there, right? Uh, bitterness, we talked about the cabbage. Spice, it's not spicy enough. So unfortunately, I've got my uh, red chili. And so I have a little, I have a little sambal here, but you can use any kind of chili that you like, but just by going through my flavor profile, I'm like, oh, you know, I want more spiciness. I know I want more acidity in there, you know, so these are the kind of issues that good chefs ask themselves. And I spend most of my time thinking about the flavor. So that's really the key. Okay, so I'm going to taste one more time. I'm so wary of this because, oh, that's spicy, right? So <laughs> I'm so wary of this because we don't double dip in the kitchen. We have plastic spoons without them out, right? <laughs> so in the restaurant, anyways. So I'm very happy with this soup. I'm gonna let this sit and little, get those aromas out a little bit more. Meanwhile, my timer got off here. Oh, almost done the latest. Yay, look at this. Oh, now we're talking, huh? Look at what I got here. The sweet potatoes with the water one spice. I can smell it, it's so fragrant right now. It's like unbelievable. It outpowered the flavors on the other side. So it's really, this is really something, okay? So I'm gonna just put my dishes together here a little bit. And what I'm gonna do here is, first I'm gonna finish this soup here, okay? So you get a little bit of an idea. And again, the flavors in this soup could be used for anything. Don't be shy, you can, galangala can go in a curry, it can go in a stew. When you go and eat the Thai soup, it's really just a soup, but for me, this is dinner. Okay, so we like to do it. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's very simple. It's really just the cabbage soup with some potatoes and their carrots, shiitake. And again, the shiitake, I don't know. I'm sure you have talked to Dr. Furman. It's about breast cancer research and so on, and they're really, really helpful. So I always try to include the mushrooms wherever I can in my dishes. In this case, I have only regular basil, 
Again, this is my local basil, but if you can't get Thai basil, it's really good. And what I want to do here is I, I tear the basil. And what this does is, you know, when you ever eat like a basil, it's really fine cut and you can hardly taste it, right? So, but if you tear it in there or in, in the, the Thai cuisine, they put the whole leaf in there. Now they make you bite into the leaf. And when, they, when you bite into the leaf, you release sort of flavor. And that's how, I, that's the idea behind it. Does it make sense? Yep. So get four leaves in there, just load it up. And I'm gonna add my lime juice in there. And I'm gonna drizzle this everywhere. And I like my lime, I kind of just put it right in there like this. And this is my soup. So this is the first dish concluded. Okay, so again, I can smell it from right here. It's really, really amazing. Just the calandra and cilantro and all that. And so I'll show you a trick here. Because people always, they don't eat this the right way. So if you ever go out and eat Thai food, okay, I didn't get the, there. See, I want to grab one of these um, lemongrass. So as I mentioned before, the lemongrass, so this is the cooked one now, right? And I'm going to put it right on here maybe. Okay, so when you ever go out and eat and you see that lemongrass, don't just throw it out. You want to actually like sort of bite on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, this is so good, right? Perfect. Like, you bite into it and you get so much more flavor out. And it's just, so while you're eating the soup, you bite into this a little bit. And you can do the same with galangala. And galangala is the woody little piece and you just chew on it a little bit. It will, it will change the way you look at flavor forever. It's like totally amazing, okay? So, so this is my soup. Now we're gonna go on to the second dish and we're gonna see how this turned out. So the theme is for flavor, right? So what you want to do about it is you really want to like taste everything. And it's really about tasting, not the best recipe has no, you can't do anything with the best recipe if you're not adjusting for different products. Right? So the lentil may be different, your potato is different, your stock is a little bit strong, a little bit lighter next time, you know? So always make sure, spend more time putting it all together and then just tasting and taste it again and really get some flavor in there, okay? So my soup now hasn't cooked long enough yet. This is gonna take like another, I don't know how long, 10, 15 minutes or something. But all chefs taste the food while it's cooking. So you never really just Taste it just at any flavor when it's good. You gotta like keep tasting it and see how it reduces and everything. I'm very happy with how this is right now. And since I cooked this yesterday already, this batch, I know this is already cooked to perfection. Um, so this is nice and thick. I don't know if you can see this right here. Uh, you're gonna have a cinnamon stick in there. You're gonna have bay leaf in there. You're gonna have the nice thyme in there and lots of kalangala spice or uh, garam masala spice. So we're gonna do this next dish here. I am, what I wanna do here is, now you could make this into a soup easily. You can make this into a ragu. You can make the lentil an own dish or just of the lentils. There's actually no need to really do the potato, this and that, because what you're really seeing here is this in itself is totally gratifying, right? Like you have a little rice left over, so you have a little rice next to the lentils and you got yourself a dish, right? So as restaurateurs, we try to make look, things look uh, good, of course. I'm gonna play around with that. I'm gonna put my potato on here. And I'm getting something. I'm gonna actually present my bay leaf. Right? As long as it looks good, I get to charge another 10 bucks, right? So that's how we do it. <laughs> okay. uh, 
let me say, I'm gonna like finish this off a little nicer here. One second. Uh, I'm back, I'm back. Sorry. I have a little bit of a cashew butter. And I use this for our next dish too. So I, I just make more of it, okay? So this is, you can call this sour cream. Oops, there it is. So there's a recipe somewhere floating around. I think it's one, uh, a third cup of um, cashews to one cup of water and I just pureed. And there is a nutritional yeast in there and a little vinegar. And so that's my fake sour cream. Now, when you do these dishes, what I like about it is, I don't know if you ever noticed, but in the old days when you had the chili, you have this, the hot soup and the ice cold sour cream. And there's something about that. There's something about this hot cold variation. Okay, so in this dish, I like to put on ice cold sour cream or cashew, if you will. And again, there's very little cashew actually in there because you lose a lot of water there, right? So it's not just nuts. So, so that's not the case. So can you see this dish here, sort of? Now I'm just gonna go around with a little drizzle here. You don't have to do this, but I do, and I get to charge you so much more money and my wife is happy, you know? So. That is so funny, because when I, I worked as a pastry chef at a restaurant and that was somebody, that was just their job, the plating. Just the plating. So here I have pomegranate juice. I don't know if I ever do this, Chef AJ. We just cooked down pomegranate juice. And I use very little, there's just a few drops on there, but this is a lot of tartness. There's something, it's not really bitter, but it's like tart sour. So I really, really like this, but I go very, just droplets. It'll make all the difference in the world, okay? Because while you're thinking now, when you eat this kind of dish as a chef, we think in terms of like, there we go. I don't know, I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer. Now we can see this. But when I'm eating, or as a chef, I think, well, how can I get different flavor profiles in there, right? So I have the water bond with the sweet potato. Then the richness of the sweet potato with the, the lentils. And this is why I like sweet potatoes for this case, because it adds that richness all together, right? So it's already like a really nice filling dish. The lentils, they're nicely stewed with tomatoes. So the acidity comes from the tomatoes in this dish. The tartness that we said was from the pomegranates right here. And I present there a little bit the bay leaf and the cinnamon just for the looks of it, okay? So this is my dish. I had it yesterday, it was so good. It was really, really good, right? So uh, go and try this. The other thing I wanna say here is, with this sweet potato recipe, you can do so many different things, so many different spices, so many different, you can do different nuts on there. You can make it, what's really nice is just a salad. Right, so you just bring out the potatoes, season it up a little bit for crying out loud, right? That's why we're doing this, right? Season up your sweet potatoes, roast them a little bit more if you like, or just bring it to the table and then serve it as a big salad. Like I eat every day a big salad, right? That's all I need. Many times I just roast some veggies in the oven, I put them over my salad. And you know, Dr. Furma was gracious enough to show me actually how to eat a salad. This is actually a good short story. I should share this with you. Okay, so everybody go with this dish? Yes. Yeah? Okay, we only if you have questions, we do it later, okay? Um, this is, I thought was a really good story because I had read our Dr. Foreman's books and this goes back 10 years, right? And so he invites me to do a cooking class and there's the people there. And so in preparation, we, we go over to Whole Foods and we pick up a salad. And you know, when you go to Whole Foods, you have like these boxes, the brown boxes, right? There's like this size and then there's like this size, right? And so anyhow, so we go to the salad buffet, we load up on a salad and he gets more and I take even more. And I was like, wow, this is great. They have salad for three days, right? I'm gonna be happy here, right? And so we sit down at the meeting and it's the first time I understood what a nutritarian eats. Because up until then, I didn't get it. Even I read the books, I read the science, I knew about the phytonutrients and all the minerals and all, the, all that's good stuff that's in the four letter one, whatever, right? But when you actually see how much salad 
you actually consume. You, you have a big a salad. That was that was just earth shattering to me. And then I was like, ah, that's what it's about, right? So so a good lesson learned there. And I hope somebody gets something out of this. Yeah. Well, At least often, let me know if you do. Often when you go to you know restaurants, the salad is it's it's like one slice of tomato, one slice of cucumber, and like it's it's nothing it's nothing exactly it's a garnish it's a garnish i cooked a very fancy restaurant and that's exactly how we did it they're true uh okay so let's move this down here um chef a few people are asking if you have a social media presence where they can follow you and find more recipes like these beautiful ones you created today i'm very honored thank you so much uh I don't do as much anymore. I had a little Instagram. This is a mix, a hodgepodge of my things, but I present both of my work. So you will see me do the Borlay, you'll see me do the mix six. You see quite a few of these really nice uh, nutritarian dishes. So I've worked with Dr. Furman, Dr. Mike Dreger, and these are on Chef Martin Oswald on Instagram. Chef Martin Oswald, I think that's the one. So, so, but there is actually a good amount of on there, and especially the dishes you may have seen on uh, the, the dishes I did for Dr. Furman. I think they're really interesting. Some of the salads I did for him, some of the big salads. I do like this mango salad that I picked up down in um, Cozumel one time, and it's very, very simple. You know, it's just cacti, and there is. Uh, avocado on there and mango and just a little lime juice and really, really nice, good stuff. So yeah, by all means, check it out. Chef Martin Ross, or you can befriend me at the, um, my Facebook site. And yeah, so a little more modest there, I guess. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna cook the next dish. Do we have enough time? Oh, hurry up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let me bring this closer. Can everybody see this? Okay, so it's the lemon and cauliflower risotto. Coincidentally, this is also a, a, a version of it in Dr. Furman's book. So we'll see if we get to everything here. Okay, let me bring this over anyways. All right, and we start off with the onion, garlic, ginger, leeks, and cauliflower. So it's sort of similar. Unfortunately, I don't have the right pot here, so we're gonna have to do this. Okay, I'm just putting it in, and imagine what we did before. If I had a wider pot, I would do it this way in this case. I'm just simply gonna cook it in my little pot. A wider pot is better. If I use this pot, it will be better. Because um, it allows me to roast it more, but it doesn't really matter that much. In this case, because we're dealing with cauliflower, cruciferous vegetables, superfood, we use it whenever we can. I have cauliflower, I have leeks from the allium family, I have red peppers, okay. I have the ginger, just a little ginger. And the ginger is sort of my sodium replacement. Does that make sense? I'm just looking how can I replace that sodium? I use a lot of other sp uh, spices and herbs. I really like caraway as a sodium replacement. Even celery seed in certain uh, circumstances. You know, it's a little bit of tart, but that's a good one too. Nutritional yeast, obviously, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna bring this up a little bit here. And need a spoon or something that looks like one. Okay. All right, I'm gonna just speed this up. I'm not gonna roast this as long as I normally would. But you get the idea, I showed last time already how to do this, right? So give it like five, seven minutes and roast this. And you're sweating it. The cauliflower will get a little moist and wet and release its flavor. But you really don't have that much flavor there except the onions that are in there, the leeks and the peppers. 
So at this stage, this is a pretty bland fish. All you're gonna get is more like the bitterness of the uh, bit of tart, the cauliflower, you know, it's got sort of four bites in there, you know, so it's a different program. So now I'm gonna spend my time, and I use a lot of time here. Now we can see this, this is like, okay. What I like the best, my absolute favorite of work time is lavish. I don't know if anybody's familiar with lavish, but you gotta get lavish. There's no way without lavish. There's no love without lavish. Is that it? I don't know. But you can special order it. I don't know what this brand is here. Bioma, USD Organic. Uh, for anybody who wants to see it, this is a really nice one. Lavish is its own era. It's not really celery. It's not really parsley. We use it, we call it Maggi Kraut. So it's, it's really widely used in Austria, Germany for any stew that you cook and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna put my stock in there now. I'm gonna get a little bit more here. But basically, you wanna just like cover it a little bit, should be like, just enough to cook it down. So here for seeing the cauliflower. The cauliflower you can already get at Whole Foods pre-chopped. You can put it in the in the roboku, in the blender, whatever. But you know, I chop it down with the hand. It, it just really doesn't take that long. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna just cook this for a couple of minutes. And since I'm trying to push for for time now, I forgot to put in my spice. So better would have been to put in the spice. Okay, so there's two tablespoons. Um, but I'm not gonna worry too much. I'm just gonna put it in because all I miss is like a little bit of the fragrance, right? But it will be fine. So I'm gonna put that in there. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the simmer. You don't want too much liquid in there because you want to sort of make it a creamy, nice dish, okay? This can be an omelet by itself. You just, uh, you can use it with the potato. Again, you can use any kind of little starch left over you have. You can put more veggies in there. I'll put a little big bay leaf in there. And I want to make sure that I got everything that I'm talking about. So this is actually a Ras Al Hanut. Ras Al Hanut has a different flavor profile a little bit. There's a lot of cardamom in there. I like it. It's a nice little spice, different spice flavor. And uh, please remind me to talk about spice maybe after I'm done with this dish real quick. So I'm gonna bring this to a little boil here. And a little bit. A little bit of my lemon. What I want to do with the lemon is I want to really zest them. So we have organic lemon here. You know, people always ask me with organic, and I'm always like, well, if you can afford to eat 100% organic, go for it, right? If that's what you want to do. But I asked several doctors, and they all tell me that a lot of these studies have been done with non organic foods. And also my father-in-law too ate a lot of non-organic foods and he has reversed heart disease eating non-organic foods. So no SOS free is much more important. I put my money on that of organic and non-organic any day. I'm lucky enough that I can get organic foods here. So I do. And I think people with autoimmune issues and cancer and so on, they should take it serious. Uh, but again, if you don't have that money, you know, don't lose any sleep over it, right? This is not SOS free. That's all I can say. Okay, so lemon, little lemon zester. And when you do this, what you don't want to do is the white. You don't want to get the white parts in there. You only want to get the, the yellow part. The yellow is the flavor. Think about it this way. What's white is just bitter. 
The only way you can overcome the bitterness is if you make preserved lemons. Now, preserved lemons are a totally different deal. I love preserved lemons. They're classically done with just sugar and salt. And I've come up with a killer recipe that is actually with, uh, I cook it in water. So you put cinnamon and, and chili in the water and, and clove, and you bring it to a boil. And then you drain it off and then you boil it one more time and you let it sit. And after so many days, let's see, you, you take out just the flesh, the outer side of it, and it's the most delicious lemon flavor you will ever get. So in this case, we're just using a regular lemon. Again, the results don't take too long to cook here. The Russell Hamdut flavor is coming really out nicely. I put a lot of acidity in there now with the lemon. And depending how you like it, you take one or two lemons. I'm gonna do one lemon just right now, maybe adjust it to two lemons later on. And I just use my fingers right here because I like to work with my hands. <laughs> okay. All right. So we got the thyme, we got the bay leaf, we got the lemon, we got the acidity. And now I just need to cook it long enough so it's actually tender. <clears throat> but I still want it al dente, you know, like when you bite into that arborio rice, there's a lot, there's a lot of bite to it, right? That's really what we're looking for. So this this is a, a fast food, if you will, right? A fast food dish. Mm -hmm. Not perfect. I'm gonna put a little bit more time in there. Okay, here we go. So I could put more bay leaf in there. I could put a little more chili in there. And last I put in my cashew butter. And this once again was the cashew water. And I've already nutritional yeast in there, a little acidity, okay? So I like to go too much. This is like less than a cup. You'll see the recipe. You don't have to use the whole recipe here. But the way I do it is, you saw I used it on this dish. So I always make a little bit more and then I just have it and last a good five days, no problem. Okay. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Nice. So I like it thick. So just adjust it, toy around with it a little bit, right? How do you like it, right? You like it more creamy? Mm. Oh, not good. Okay. Okay. What I do want is a little black pepper in there. So I want a little black pepper and I'm sorry, it's not in the recipe, but I like it back from black pepper. And in this case, I don't need to use my grind. I just want a little bit of background. Uh, pecan flavor, if you will. Okay, so this is good enough for me. And then I put a little salad for you here today. Now, I've already said before, you know, I really, really like the salads and everything. But I want you to think about salad as a flavoring item. So this is something I learned in Wolfgang Puck. Wolfgang Puck used a lot of his dishes where he puts a salad on top. I thought that's a crazy idea, right? Well, but then when you eat the whole dish, like, ah, you know, he's got all this acidity coming down from the salad. You see a break from the rich flavors, right? So now you have the salad to give you a break from the rich flavors. It's really nice. Uh, so I've made a quick uh, salad here. I found some nectarines. I don't know if you can see this. Okay. I have nectarines, I have tomatoes, red onions. And so really, if you let it sit for 30 minutes, that's really good because then the, the red onions activate a little bit. And so what I do here is I do my favorite of all time. I picked up some uh, tarragon. Again, most Americans don't like tarragon. It's a tough sell in the restaurant. But for me at home, that's, that's my flavor. That's, that gives me like such a great, you know, different flavor profile when I eat my risotto. Okay, stir this a little bit. Be careful with this risotto because it's gonna burn, okay? So once it's cooked, you just take it off. It takes 10 minutes, it's done. 
Okay. So you could, I put a lot of tarragon in there. You can put a little vinegar in there and so on. And then be really generous. I like mint as well, because, well, why not mint? <laughs> I do a, a salad I created for the Borlay concept, which was a minted tomato salad. It's everybody's favorite. It's from a Spanish chef I work with. And uh, they use it in their lambs and whatever. And I'm like, oh, I got to include this in my vegetarian, my nutritarian cooking, you know? All right. So, so yeah, use a good amount. Again, we have it or a big chunky when you bite into it. They want you to taste it. And then in this case, all we want to do. I'm going to put a little bit of the risotto right here. You can present it with the herb or not. Oh, I'm flutty. Okay, so we're just going to do a little bit right now. I have to uh, get this clean off. All right, got to clean it, right? And I could put like a little bit pomegranate glaze on there. I can use a little uh, balsamic glaze on there. But in this case, we're going to have acidity from our salad. Well, speaking of balsamic glaze, you're going to get two free bottles of your balsamic vinegar and flavor of your choice for being on the show. So you'll have some glaze. I, you know what? I was going to cook a recipe with that. And then I, I was in Hawaii and I just never got to it. <laughs> But that would be that would be wonderful. I would be very excited. Yeah, so I use I use so much balsamic on everything, right? So I use balsamic. I use it as a glaze in like like all the dishes, you know, because it gives such a nice lip, you know. So it's one of the best vinegars you can really have, you know. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so I use a good amount here of this. Set. Nice would be you get a little bit greens in there, but. A little shy on the greens, but I got a lot of mint here. How about that? Okay. And you could garnish this out more, but you know what? I know this is going to be very, very yummy. Okay. So the Ras El Hanout flavored um, lemon risotto with cauliflower, a little tomato salad with the nectarines, tarragon, mint in this case. And uh, so that's sort of my uh, conclusion here with my dishes. Okay. Smells so good. I want to bite into it right now. <laughs> and please, please feel free to eat. That is so impressive. The plating, like you said, and it's amazing. Well, it's such a simple dish, right? But I think what 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 is nice about this is a it cooks so fast, right? So if you have it, well, you can you can cut it. You can order it pre-cut already at Whole Foods, right? You, you can just go there and pick it up. But it doesn't take that long to chop it yourself. I mean, it's so quick, right? And then it cooks within 10 minutes or less. You just load it up with all other veggies and you have a meal in no time. And it's very, very nice. You know, it's very nice and rich flavored, you know? So, so I like that a lot, okay? Yeah, well, um, the one, the few things I wanted to get across was with flavors and I have some notes here. And I don't know if you posted it or not, but it was really the, um, spice blends that we were talking about and i think that's really key now i don't know is it posted by any chance you well, know? well so so chef i only have five thousand characters to work with so i either could put those in or the recipes in so i put the recipes yeah in. Not, yeah not no, that's right. very yeah no obviously i was uh but so for your viewers just so everybody understands and give them a little bit idea the challenge with spices is that you will find everything has salt and sugar in it so you get a barbecue spice, you get a Cajun spice, doesn't matter what you get, everything has salt and sugar in it, right? So I can only recommend do what I do, make your own spice mix. And it's really easy. People don't think how easy this is, right? It is so easy because you make one mix and you have it for half a year, right? And you just use what you have already, what you already purchased. All you do is you're cheating. You're looking up the recipe from the Google it, right? And you leave out the salt, leave out the sugar and just Google it. And there's so many great recipes on there. I do it the same way, although then I start off with the profile and then I adjust it to my flavor profile, right? So I have created, I don't know, dozens of spices now 
for different companies as well. And uh, so for my catering, when I cater for 7,000, I make all spice mixes. There's always 20 spice mixes every time that I personally make. It, it doesn't take much time. And just stir it up a little bit, get our different flavors. But I wanted to point out, since this is not going to be featured on the on the uh, internet, so we can you can simply look this up by Asian spice, a barbecue spice, or a chili, a Texan chili. It's actually from Texas. Some people don't know this. But anyhow, so the, the, the chili spice is like, a cumin chili flavor profile, the, the, the dry rub that you always get in cans is like mustard spice and garlic and paprika. So they're all a little bit different, but you're looking for that characteristic. What's the characteristic of the flavor, right? A Cajun spice is like oregano. There's always the black pepper, garlic, thyme in there, but they're very distinct. And I like to use smoked paprika. So if I made a a barbecue sauce, for example, we have done many times. I always use the smoked paprika, right? Use the dates. It's so easy to make a killer barbecue spicy sauce. It's so easy, right? A sauce, a barbecue. So many people, when we did our test trial, really enjoyed the barbecue flavors. So it's a great way to do, I think, you know? Uh, and then a few more I want to point out. So in the Asian, you, you saw already what I did there, you know, the Thai, but there's the five spice blends. So that's a good one. There's name one is called Togarashi from Japan. Those are great ones. Uh, in Middle Eastern, you have the Rasl Hanut, you have Dukkha, you have Gara Masala, and you know, all these various masalas. Some of them have uh, mango powder in there. You know, they're really unique and just look it up. You know, they're really nice to have. Uh, South America, you have, of course, Adobe. In Europe, we use lots of caraway to blush, right? It has like the paprika caraway, garlic, and onions, right? Um, and then chorizo, again, the smoked paprika. And so just cheat, you know, just look up on the internet, a standard spice mix and make your own. It's very easy to do. Yeah. You know, there's a spice company that I love in Timuron that makes SOS free spices, like in flavors like pepperoni. I, I, I need to send you some of those because I think you'd really like them. I would love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask. The, I'm going to ask uh, Nick to send you some because you're somebody that I think could really use them, and because you already cook this way. Because you know, it's one thing when you tell a chef at a restaurant not to use oil, and they look at you, but you tell them no salt, and it's like you're going to blow their mind. They don't. They can't <laughs> uh, picture that at all. <laughs> yeah, that is so true, right? So I think uh, anyone who takes that challenge on, they could do really well for themselves. They just got to connect with the audience. Yeah, I think that's really what it is. Right? Here's a wonderful question from Vanessa. I know that in culinary school, this was actually a class we took, but she says, Chef Oswald, do you have any tips or suggestions for how to begin experimenting with plating at home for those of us who are absolute newbies or beginners? Ha, ah, plating at home. So there's the classic, we took a question. Here, look at this. Look, look at this dish. Here we, here we go. And so if you're really lazy, you do this. You do the, the three things. Odd numbers work really good. I don't know. Well, maybe in the camera, you cannot see it as well. So you do it a three or five, but it instantly lifts the plating experience because the eye speaks to three or odd numbers for some reason. Every time you plate something in fours, it doesn't work so well. The other thing is color variation, right? So you see my one dish where I have this way example you see the white and then just a little drizzle of the balsamic on there or pomegranate glaze in this you know you instantly you know you give it a lift right so it's it's also it's a look thing when you look at when you go on my instagram chef martin oswald you'll see like my presentations that i do some of them are more complex than others i should say <laughs> but um color variation drizzle and three would be my first starter with and then here you need something green. So if you want to go on the internet and post, I wouldn't post this without something green on it, right? So we'll put like a little salad, okay? All right. That's neat. People are asking how you make your preserved lemons. So my preserved lemons, they are so good. They're like insanely good. Um, I try to do it like, makes sense so you can do it at home. I use like five gallon pocket, okay? So a little different. I use a whole case of lemons. That's how much I do of it. But I, at home I would do, let's say, I would start maybe with five lemons. You cut them in half. 
I used to do varieties, so I just cut them in half. That's all you need to do. And then put the cinnamon, two cinnamon sticks in there, maybe a teaspoon of chili and black peppercorns and coriander and clove, just a little bit of each, and bring it to a boil. Okay, now there's a, there's a fine line here, right? So if you throw the water out the first time, you can. You take a little bit of the bitterness away. You know the pith has some bitterness, right? You take a little bit away, but you don't have to do it that way. I've done it successfully just cooking it one time, but then you let it simmer for like five, seven minutes. Okay, bring it to boil, let it sit seven minutes, and then let the whole thing chill very slowly, right? Normally you do 30 days with this lemon flavor, but anyhow, put it in the refrigerator, give it a couple of days, they need to sort of like get that flavor going. And then, the juices of the lemon have gone over into the water now, right? So it's very acidic, right? So the, the pith, the outside gets flavored with that acidity. That's where the flavor comes from, okay? The lemon is flavoring itself. Sounds weird, but that's what it is, right? <laughs> so then you can cut out all the bark. You know, when you use one a half, you take it out. You take off bark of that lemon and just use, is it a quarter inch or so of it? And you just cut this in anything. And it is so good. I mean, you can put it in risottos. I cook it with everything. If I had it today, I would have cooked it right there. Almost in every dish I can use it. That's how good it is. So flemon and acidity is killer combination. Wow, that is fantastic. I hope you'll come back because you're amazing. I ah. mean, you're such a <laughs> wonderful chef. I'm just curious when Dr. Furman eats at your restaurant, what does he order? So he goes, interesting, you're on the line with everybody else. Like the foreman was there in Snowmass at Mix 6. What was that? April 5th or something like that, right? So he brings a group for the retreat. This year we had COVID, of course, there's a little bit less people. Normally there's a larger group, 60, 70 skiers. They go skiing, they come to my restaurant and then they eat lunch and dinner. And he stands on the line, eats with everybody else, everything. And I'm always so happy when I see him there, right? Because he just sits down with everybody, can talk to him more casual. And it's just such a joy to actually see somebody who engages with everybody and really wants to help people, right? I mean, that's really, that's all you can ask somebody like that, right? I mean, we have a certain celebrity status. I I live in Aspen. I've seen a lot of stuff, you know. Some people, they lock themselves in the corner. And, you know, I mean, we have had a lot of celebrities in, and some of them really just privacy, right? And and he's, for the most part, always so engaging and it's just wonderful to see that happening. And yeah, so he eats everything. You and, and what you see here is what he's eating basically, yeah. You wanna hear a funny story? When I when I lived in Los Angeles, he came to my house a couple of times for dinner when he was in town. And one time we filmed a couple, filmed a couple episodes of my YouTube show that at that time was called The Chef and the Dietitian. And we did a, a, a funny episode where he was playing a French chef. You have to see it, it's hilarious. But he was making everything with a lot of sugar, oil and salt. And so we went to Ralph's, our local market and somebody spotted him buying this in line. It was hilarious. <laughs> I'm sure he got a lot of heat that right yeah absolutely a uh, bullet wants to know do you sing or have vocal training do i have vocal training yes i do my vocal training comes from the catering so i cater for up to 2500 people it's an open air concert and it's not so much singing but i have 160 employees that help me out locally people and the music is playing all day long so my vocal talent is that i have to be louder than the music they're playing there. So I'm very loud, but I'm very, also very calm. You know, I, I always find when you do big events that, that are very nerve wracking, you have to stay calm inside. It's really important to sort of control it and your voice that becomes very important, right? So if I scream at people, that's something different. To have a loud voice doesn't mean to be insulting, offensive, right? You're just talking about the music. But I always try to make it fun for everybody. It's a great event. And Chef AJ, you got to come next year. Don't, don't book anything for our Labor Day weekend. We're going to have to have you out here. Oh, my. Well, to work with you would yeah. be quite an honor. You are oh, just it would be. I mean, I cook everything there, right? So it's not just one thing. This is, this is traditional food. It's not vegetarian. There is, you know, the Aspen's finest, I always say, right? There's VIP tent, the super VIP tent. There is 
there's like so many, there's a, a tent for 400 people, for 800 people, for 1,700. So anyhow, there's a lot going on. Every day is different dishes. There is like, I'd like to say, 100 different dishes. And there's one vegetarian station. And so I thought you may find it interesting, you know, so. Yeah. What, what do you eat in general? I mean, all the chefs, a lot of the chefs I know, they're so busy cooking all, you know, they'll come home and have a bowl of cereal. Yeah. <laughs> well, luckily, my, my wife takes much better care of me than that. Uh, I do really well at home, right? So I do in a pyramid piece, so I do really, really well. Not so well at, at uh, so I eat what you see right here. I actually eat this stuff. I'm not just making it up, okay? But I'm also a stress eater, right? So, so to be perfectly clear, the, the, when I have, I get 800 cases of food in, okay, for my events, right? 10,000 pounds of food, right? So I have to taste everything. I'm not at a stage where it could go 100% clean. Now, Dr. Furman luckily has this 5 10% meat thing going on, right? Where you say, well, you know, certain studies say that you may be fine with as much as 10% of meat without getting cancer. So that somehow makes me justify. But if I went out of, uh, entirely with the catering, then I think it would completely switch over. But at this stage, I'm not, I'm not there yet, you know? No worries. Do you have time for exercise? Do I have time? So I go skiing, right? So we just went for a five mile hike here uh, before the show. And so, yeah, we do, but I do light exercise, right? So some people, they work out heavy and so on. I think Dr. Neil Barnard has a great intro on that. You know, the studies that indicate, well, if you just walk for so long, that will work really well for you. And uh, so, so I, you know, being is my passion, one of them anyways, bicycling as well, you know, I should say, you know, so for sure. I have to say, before I forget, I have to say hello from uh, Mitch Roth, the mayor of Hawaii. Uh, and that's Matt for you, Chef H.A. He's a big fan of yours. She's watching you all the time. So Hawaii, you got a big following in Hawaii. Charlie Deutsch is there and I think you got to go there as well, you know. Oh my God, that's my, it's my favorite state. That is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe she'll come on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Mayor Mitch may, well, we'll see. He's doing like a cooking show. And so maybe that may be something interesting, you know, so it's definitely very health oriented as well, you know, so. That yeah. would be great. People are saying what an extraordinary chef you are. They would love to have you back. Well, thank you. This has just been just, do you, do you teach any cooking classes? So I have taught quite a few cooking classes, but then I fell in with uh, Tim Gannon. It's a, a quick, interesting story here. Tim Gannon was the founder of Alt Steakhouse. And he came to Pyramid Bistro and he's like, well, I want to do this new restaurant concept for my son. And I want to redeem myself from all the blooming onion and, you know, so. So anyhow, so he invited me to do a restaurant in Florida. It's built into a chain now. There's like 18 of them. And I did all the spices for them. And so I get caught up and poured in various directions. My ideal vision would be that we can incorporate the SOS free movement into a, and offer this to the public, right? I mean, I think there's enough people if, if all of us, you know, Dr. Lauren Marvis, I mean, there's like, so many various doctors and you know health counselors and i mean your job alone is just stunning what you have done over the years i i've watched you over 10 years now by the way right <laughs> who knew you should have contacted me oh, yeah. i would have loved to have met you <laughs> so 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 but my focus is restaurateur and i think if i succeed in what i want to do one day we'll either do a restaurant or a concept so we can go to a big city and offer this food for people who really need it, right? My vision would be offer it to people with heart disease, give it to people with diabetes, which this dish is all about, right? Cauliflower, lowest glycemic food right there, right? It's about diabetes reversal, right? So I think it can be done. I think it really can be done. Well, I sure wish there were more chefs like you that could marry the nutritional science with the classical training. Won't that, wouldn't that be amazing? I think we're going to get a lot more. We got to show them how to make money, though. That's the challenge. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, we, we learned today that it's the plating because then we can charge $10 more. <laughs> <laughs> it's the plating and the flavor. Yeah. The reason why you don't say flavor is because you cannot smell what's sitting behind me. I tell you, this is just fantastic. You know, like the, I, 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 all these Asian flavors and everything. The whole house is like full with these flavors. And I cooked it yesterday. My wife is like, 
coming from upstairs. She's like, well, what are you cooking? You know, uh, so the Galangalores works, you know. So, yeah. uh, Gina's saying she wants the information you gave us and I, I'm, I'm happy to give it to people. The only thing I could do is send it out to my mailing list because I, I, I own YouTube cuts us off at 5,000 characters. So no, no. So I think it's very simple. As you said before, just go on Google your favorite. It's about your favorite spice, right? So not everybody likes Indian, but if you like barbecue spice, just Google something and start there. And you'll see within a short time, you get lots of different flavors going. And it's, it's so simple. Get a matters curry, get, you know, get any of the simple things, start there. Um, the one thing I didn't mention, what I try to do with flavor building is you get a curry style flavor and then also add a whole peppercorn in there, like a whole coriander, a whole cinnamon, a whole black peppercorn that releases a different profile of flavor because curries, they typically sit in a shell for a year, right? So, so everything is ground. So that helps in, in additionally, I should say, yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated your expertise right. and passion. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have another culinary demonstration, this time from Anna Schoen and Jacqueline Bradley. They're going to be making a gluten-free bread that can also be used as a pizza crust, a papaya salad, and a chocolate papaya pudding. Next time, we'll have to have you do desserts. All right, let's do it. Because those Let's are my favorite. Thanks so much, Chef. All Oswald. right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. Glad we hooked Bye. up.